Hey folks, Mr. Howard here, uh, chapter six of Animal Farm. Last time was a really important chapter. Um, Napoleon ousted Snowball. Stalin ousted Trotsky. And um, really took control of Animal Farm. Stopped the meetings. Uh, he, you know, is controlling these vicious dogs that seem to threaten all of the animals. Um, he set up an order in which, you know, he is in charge with Squealer and this guy Minimus. And then the dogs seem to be sort of second in charge, the pigs third in charge. And then all the animals after that, uh, he declared that he was, uh, the windmill was nonsense, but now he's building the windmill. Uh, so lots of things happened last chapter. Um, yeah, just look at the language at the beginning of this chapter to see if you can figure out, you know, how the animals behave. Um, I think we're starting to get the thematic stuff though. So before I, before we actually start reading this chapter, let's let's talk about themes. Um, you know, in, in America, um, one of the central themes that has been taught with animal farms is sort of like this idea of anti-communism, that that communism is a is a failed form of government. And uh, they look at things like this takeover by by Snowball or by Napoleon as evidence of that. But I really don't think that that's what um, Orwell was trying to get across. I mean, when you listen to Old Major's speech, when you look at the way Boxer works, um, you know, when you, you see all these admirable elements of communism, he's certainly not um, writing a manifesto about the, the inadequacies of communism. Uh, what he's getting at, I think, and what we're starting to see really become apparent is um, that communism doesn't work because people aren't good. Some people are. The boxers of the world are great people. Um, even Snowball, despite his his lack of empathy for dead people and his power, uh, his desire for power, he was he was working to better the lives of the animals on the farm. But you got the cat, you got Molly, people who don't work at all, people who are only care, only concerned about themselves and are selfish and are looking to make their lives easier and more fun and more enjoyable. And then you got Napoleon, people who are interested in power and control. Uh, these people exist, and in, in a system, they're going to try and get the power. They're going to try to wrest control. And, you know, maybe that's the flaw of communism, is a system that would work perfectly if human beings were decent, all of them, but because we're not, um, you end up with dictatorships and, and situations like happened in communist Russia and happened in North Korea. One of the things that's really interesting about this book is clearly... Um, Orwell wrote it about Russia, but it applies so well to North Korea and what happened there. Uh, you can actually almost just take this and, and say Napoleon is the, um, you know, the, the leading family um, over there, and, and you can look at, at how it fits. Uh, but I will, I will stop talking and I'll just start reading. Um, All that year, the animals worked like slaves. Hey, your first simile in this new world that Napoleon has created, the animals worked like slaves, like serfs, perhaps? What's really changed for the Russian peasants under communism? The idea that they're free. That's it. But they were happy in their work. They grudged no effort or sacrifice, well aware that everything they did was for the benefit of themselves and those of their kind who would come after them, and not for a pack of idle, thieving human beings. Orwell is aware of the irony that he's created here. Um, who's the pack of idle, thieving people on this farm? The pigs, right? Like, they've supplanted the human beings. They've taken that role. Um, there was an upper class, and that upper class was humans, you know, or the noblemen in communist or czarist Russia, but in communist Russia, who's the upper class? Party members, you know, the the elite. It happens. Human beings tend to divide themselves this way. Whether you want to live in a classless communist utopia or not, um, I'm going to stop moralizing. We'll just we'll just get to reading. Throughout the spring and summer, they worked a sixty-hour week. And in August, Napoleon announced that there would be work on Sunday afternoons as well. This work was strictly voluntary, but any animal who had absented himself from it would have his rations reduced by half. Pause. Is that voluntary? Are we just playing with language here? Even so, it was found necessary to leave certain tasks undone. 
the harvest was a little less successful than in the previous year, and two fields which should have been sown with roots in the early summer were not sown because the plowing had not been completed early enough. It was possible to foresee that the coming winter would be a hard one. The windmill presented unexpected difficulties. There was a good quarry of limestone on the farm, and plenty of sand and cement had been found in the, one of the outhouses, so that all the materials for building were at hand, but the problem the animals could not at first solve was how to break up stone into... Oops. Let's try that again. Uh, pieces of a suitable size. There seemed to be no way of doing this except with picks and crowbars, which no animal could use because no animal could stand on his hind legs. Only after weeks of vain effort did the right idea occur to somebody, namely to utilize the force of gravity. Huge boulders, far too big to be used as they were, were lying all over the bed of the quarry. The animals lashed ropes around these and then all together, Cows, horses, sheep, any animal that could lay hold of the rope, even the pigs sometimes joined in at critical moments. They dragged them with desperate slowness. That's an oxymoron, by the way, desperate slowness. You think of desperate as being fast, but in this case, you can see how difficult it is to push one of these boulders up. Um, up the slope to the top of the quarry, where they were toppled over the edge to shatter to pieces below. Transporting the stone when it was once broken was comparatively simple. The horses carried it off in cartloads. The sheep dragged single blocks. Even Muriel and Benjamin yoked themselves into an old governess cart and did their share. By late summer, a sufficient store of stone had been accumulated, and then the building began, under the superintendence of the pigs. But it was a slow, laborious process. Frequently, it took a whole day of exhausting effort to drag a single boulder to the top of the quarry, and sometimes when it was pushed over the edge, it failed to break. Nothing could have been achieved without Boxer, whose strength seemed equal to that of the rest of the animals put together. When the boulder began to slip and the animals cried out in despair at finding themselves dragged down the hill, it was always Boxer who strained himself against the rope and brought the boulder to a stop. To see him toiling up the slope inch by inch, his breath coming fast, the tips of his hooves clawing at the ground, and his great sides matted with sweat filled everyone with admiration. Clover warned him sometimes to be careful not to overstrain himself, but Boxer would never listen to her. His two slogans, I will work harder, and Napoleon is always right, seemed to him a sufficient answer to all problems. He had made arrangements with a cockerel to call him three quarters of an hour earlier in the mornings instead of half an hour, and in his spare moments, of which there were not many nowadays, he would go alone to the quarry collect a load of broken stone and drag it down to the site of the windmill unassisted. Here's a guy who's putting everything he's got into Animal Farm, right? Like, look at Boxer. He represents those workers that are devoted to the cause, that are trying to build a communist utopia, that have faith in it. Is it, is it that he's, he's, I don't know, um, he lacks the intelligence to see the problems with it? Benjamin clearly sees the problems in it. Um, I don't know. We'll have to keep an eye on this. We have some foreshadowing in that bit, too. Hopefully you noticed it. If not, go back and look at it. Maybe you'll see the foreshadowing that's going on. The animals were not badly off throughout that summer. In spite of the hardness of their work, if they had no more food than they had in Jones's day, at least they did not have less. So are things actually better in this country that they've created? The advantage of only having to feed themselves and not having to support five extravagant human beings as well was so great that it would have taken a lot of failures to outweigh it. And in many ways, the animal method of doing things were more efficient and saved labor. Such jobs as weeding, for instance, could be done with a thoroughness impossible to human beings. And again, since no animal now stole, it was unnecessary to fence off pasture from arable land, which saved a lot of labor on the upkeep of hedges and gates. Nevertheless, as the summer wore on, various unforeseen shortages began to make themselves felt. There was a need of paraffin oil, nails, string, dog biscuits, and iron for the horse's shoes, none of which could be produced on the farm. Later, there would also be need for seeds and artificial manures, besides various tools and finally the machinery for the windmill. How these were to be procured, no one was able to imagine. One Sunday morning, when the animals assembled to receive their orders, Napoleon announced that he had decided upon a new policy. From now onwards, Animal Farm would engage in trade with the neighboring farms. Not, of course, for any commercial purpose. 
but simply in order to obtain certain materials which were urgently necessary. The needs of the windmill must override everything else, he said. He was therefore making arrangements to sell a stack of hay and part of the current year's wheat crop, and later on, if more money were needed, it would have to be made up by the sale of eggs, for which there was always a market in Willingdon. The hens, said Napoleon, should welcome the sacrifice as their own special contribution towards the building of the windmill. Pause. Okay, Napoleon's going to engage in trade with human beings. Does that break a commandment? I want to look at that. Um, then he's going to sell some of their wheat. Didn't we just say they're not going to have enough food for the winter, and now he's selling some of it? That seems like a bad idea. Um, and then the sale of eggs? I mean, wasn't Old Major's speech about how humans were consuming the produce of the farm? And uh, I mean, isn't he just about to engage in exactly what the humans were engaging in before? I mean, did these eggs represent babies? Is he feeding the babies of the of the hens to human beings? Um, and look at the way that he puts his language. Again, the hens should welcome this sacrifice as their own special contribution toward the building of the windmill. They should be thrilled that they get to make this sacrifice and so single themselves out as the greatest contributors to the building of the... What? Once again, the animals were conscious of a vague uneasiness. Never to have any dealings with human beings, never to engage in trade, never to make use of money. Had not these been among the earliest resolutions passed at the first triumphant meeting after Jones was expelled? All the animals remembered passing such resolutions, or at least they thought that they remembered it. The four young pigs who had protested when Napoleon abolished the meetings raised their voices timidly, but they were promptly silenced by a tremendous growling from the dogs. Then, as usual, the sheep broke into, four legs good, two legs bad, and the momentary awkwardness was smoothed over. Finally, Napoleon raised his trotter for silence and announced that he had already made all the arrangements. There would be no need for any of the animals to come in contact with human beings, which would certainly be most undesirable. He intended to take the whole burden upon his own shoulders. A Mr. Wimper, a solicitor, that'd be a lawyer, uh, that's a British word for lawyer, living in Willingdon, had agreed to act as an intermediary between Animal Farm and the outside world and would visit the farm every Monday morning to receive his instructions. Napoleon ended his speech with his usual cry of, Long live Animal Farm! And after the singing of Beasts of England, the animals were dismissed. Afterwards, Squealer made a round of the farm and set the animals' minds at rest. He assured them that the resolution against engaging in trade and using money had never been passed, or even suggested it was pure imagination, probably traceable in the beginnings to lies circulated by Snowball. A few animals still felt faintly doubtful, but Squealer asked them shrewdly, Are you certain this is not something you have dreamed, comrades? Have you any record of such a resolution? Is it written down anywhere? And since it was certainly true that nothing of the kind existed in writing, the animals were satisfied that they had been mistaken. Pause again. The dangers of not being literate and not writing things down and not having records. Well, the people in charge can tell you what happened and you can't argue it because you have no documents and no ability to do so. This is a story that I said at the beginning had a sub-theme about the importance of education and having an educated population. When you have an uneducated population, the government has a lot of control that they don't have when people are educated, when they can think about the decisions that they make, when they can do research because everything's in the public domain. Um, and that's one of the purposes of our public education in America. You know, like we, and, and sorry to, you know, get on this again, but we have a system in place that, that educates the population so that you can make educated, intelligent decisions. And um, the point at which you don't take your education seriously, the point at which you don't equip yourself with the ability to read and think and analyze and research and determine what's true and what's not true, um, is the point at which we lose control of our institutions, uh, which should belong to the American population and put them under control of the people who can manipulate 
um, that knowledge. So, I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot of true and important things that are in the background of this story, uh, even to America, even though Orwell was British and he was writing this for a, a British audience. Um, anyway, I love Squealer, by the way. He's, he's awesome. I think he's my favorite character. How, how horrible. Um, is it written down anywhere? Uh, that's a rhetorical question, by the way. Every Monday, Mr. Wimper visited the farm as had been arranged. He was a sly-looking little man with side whiskers, a solicitor in a very small way of business, but sharp enough to have realized earlier than anyone else that Animal Farm would need a broker and that the commissions would be worth having. The animals watched his coming and going with a kind of dread and avoided him as much as possible. Nevertheless, the sight of Napoleon on all fours, delivering orders to Wimper, who stood on two legs, roused their pride and partly reconciled them to this new arrangement. Again, go back and look at those um, seven commandments. Their relations with the human race were now not quite the same as they had been before. The human beings did not hate Animal Farm any less now that it was prospering. Indeed, they hated it more than ever. Every human being held it as an article of faith that the farm would go bankrupt sooner or later, and above all, that the windmill would be a failure. They would meet in the public houses and prove to one another by means of diagrams that the windmill was bound to fall down, or that if it did stand up, then it would never work. And yet, against their will, they had developed a certain respect for the efficiency with which the animals were managing their own affairs. One symptom of this was that they had begun to call Animal Farm by its proper name and ceased to pretend that it was called the Manor Farm. They had also dropped their championship of Jones, who had given up hope of getting his farm back and gone to live in another part of the county. Except through Whimper, there was as yet no contact between Animal Farm and the outside world. But there were constant rumors that Napoleon was about to enter into a definite business arrangement with either Mr. Pilkington of Foxwood or with Mr. Frederick of Pinchfield. But never it was noticed with both simultaneously. Oh, so we have, you know, again, an allegorical chapter or allegorical part of a chapter about the relationship of animal farm with its neighbors and with other human beings what are the rich starting to think uh, what are the ruling classes of other countries starting to think about animal farm well they're starting to call it animal farm just like in in the ussr they stopped calling it the russian empire and started calling it the ussr they started to recognize it as an actual country um they still thought the communism would fail uh but you know they they didn't um they were able to, to interact with it. You also get the sense that uh, Napoleon is trying to create some sort of a political alliance, either with England or with Germany, uh, in this case, you know, like Pilkington or Foxwood, uh, but never with both at the same time. And that's definitely the political situation of Soviet Russia. Um, they needed allies, uh, and Germany and England hated each other. And so, um, Stalin was smart enough to try and play that off uh, and, and gain something from one or the other. Um, in the event, of course, uh, Russia ended up signing a non-aggression pact with, with Nazi Germany um, and splitting Poland with them. And then um, Nazi Germany broke the treaty and invaded Russia. Like, that's real history. Uh, again, you want to pay attention to what happens in here and see if you see connections. Um, where was I? It was about this time that the pigs suddenly moved into the farmhouse and took up their residence there. Again, the animals seemed to remember that a resolution against this had been passed in the early days, and again, Squealer was able to convince them that this was not the case. It was absolutely necessary, he said, that the pigs, who were the brains of the farm, should have a quiet place to work in. It was also more suited to the dignity of the leader for of late he had taken to speaking of Napoleon under the title of leader, to live in a house than in a mere sty. Nevertheless, some of the animals were disturbed when they heard that the pigs not only took their meals in the kitchen and used the drawing room as a re recreation room, but also slept in the beds. Boxer passed it off as his usual, Napoleon is always right. But Clover, who thought she remembered a definite ruling against beds, went to the end of the barn and tried to puzzle out the seven commandments which were inscribed there. Finding herself unable to read more than the individual letters, she fetched Muriel. Muriel, she said, read me the fourth commandment. Does it not say something about never sleeping in a bed? With some difficulty, Muriel spelled it out. It says, no animal shall sleep in a bed with sheets, she announced finally. 
Go back and look at your commandments. That's an interesting line. Curiously enough, Clover had not remembered that the fourth commandment mentioned sheets. But as it was there on the wall, it must have done so. And Squealer, who happened to be passing at this moment, attended by two or three dogs, was able to put the whole matter in its proper perspective. You have heard, comrades, he said, that we pigs now sleep in the beds of the farmhouse. And why not? You did not suppose, surely, that there was ever a ruling against beds? A bed is merely a place to sleep in. A pile of straw in a stall is a bed properly regarded. The rule was against sheets, which are hum a human invention. We have removed the sheets from the farmhouse beds and sleep between blankets. And very comfortable beds they are too, but not more comfortable than we need, I can tell you, comrades. With all the brain work we have to do nowadays, you would not rob us of our repose, would you, comrades? You would not have us too tired to carry out our duties? Surely none of you wishes to see Jones back. They sleep between blankets. What's the difference between blankets and sheets? The animals reassured him on this point immediately, and no more was said about the pigs sleeping in the farmhouse beds. And when, some days afterwards, it was announced that from now on the pigs would get up an hour later in the mornings than the other animals, no complaint was made about that either. Pause. Orwell is giving you a contrast that you should notice if you're reading this story. Boxers getting up earlier and earlier and working harder and harder and the pigs, in contrast, sleeping later, more luxuries, taking more. There's takers and there's givers in this world. And if the world was made up of givers, communism would be beautiful. I think that's what Orwell's trying to get at here. Um, by autumn, the animals were tired but happy. They had had a hard year, and after the sale of part of the hay and corn, the stores of food for the winter were none too plentiful, but the windmill compensated for everything. It was almost half built now. After the harvest, there was a stretch of clear, dry weather, and the animals toiled harder than ever, thinking it well worthwhile to plod to and fro all day with blocks of stone if by doing so they could raise the walls another foot. Boxer would even come out at night and work for an hour or two on his own by the light of the harvest moon. In their spare moments, the animals would walk round and round the half-finished mill, admiring the strength and perpendicularity of its walls, and marveling that they should ever have been able to build anything so imposing. Only old Benjamin refused to grow enthusiastic about the windmill, though. As usual, he would utter nothing beyond the cryptic remark that donkeys live a long time. November came with raging southwest winds. Building had to stop because it was too, too wet to mix the cement. Finally, there came a night when the gale was so violent that the farm buildings rocked on their foundations and several tiles were blown off the roof of the barn. The hens woke up squawking with terror because they had all dreamed simultaneously of hearing a gun go off in the distance. In the morning, the animals came out of their stalls to find that the flagstaff had been blown down and an elm tree at the foot of the orchard had been plucked up like a radish. Emily. They had just noticed this when a cry of despair broke from every animal's throat. A terrible sight had met their eyes. The windmill was in ruins. With one accord, they dashed down to the spot. Napoleon, who seldom moved out of a walk, raced ahead of them all. Yes, there it lay, the fruit of all their struggles, leveled to its foundations. The stones they had broken and carried so laboriously scattered all around, unable at first to speak. They stood gazing mournfully at the litter of fallen stone. Napoleon paced to and fro. In silence, occasionally snuffling at the ground, his tail had grown rigid and twitched sharply from side to side, a sign in him of an intense me mental activity. Suddenly he halted as though his mind were made up. Comrades, he said quietly, do you know who is responsible for this? Do you know the enemy who has come in the night and overthrown our windmill? Snowball! He suddenly roared out in a voice of thunder. Snowball has done this thing in sheer malignity, thinking to set back our plans and avenge himself for his ignominious expulsion. This traitor has crept here under the cover of night and destroyed our work of nearly a year. Comrades! 
Here and now I pronounce the death sentence upon Snowball. Animal hero second class and half a bushel of apples to any animal who brings him to justice. A full bushel to anyone who captures him alive. The animals were shocked beyond measure to learn that even Snowball could be guilty of such an action. There was a cry of indignation, and everyone began thinking out ways of catching Snowball if he should ever come back. Almost immediately, the footprints of a pig were discovered in the grass at a little distance from a knoll. They could only be traced for a few yards, but appeared to lead to a hole in the hedge. Napoleon snuffed deeply at them and pronounced them to be Snowballs. He gave it his opinion that Snowball had probably come from the direction of Foxwood Farm. No more delays, comrades, cried Napoleon, when the footprints had been examined. There is work to be done. This very morning we begin rebuilding the windmill, and we build all through the winter, rain or shine. We will teach this miserable traitor that he cannot undo our work so easily. Remember, comrades, there must be no alteration of our plans. They shall be carried out to the day. Forward, comrades, long live the windmill. Long live Animal Farm. And that's the end of the chapter. But there's so much more to say. Uh, wow. Okay, so the windmill fell down. You guys believe Snowball destroyed it? That's going to be your assignment. Uh, I want you to go and look back and find what evidence you can find. What happened to the windmill? What evidence is there in this chapter? that tells you as a reader, if you think about it, if you're intelligent about it, what happened to the windmill. Go, take a look, see what you can find out. Um, the reason I'm having you do that is because the narrative, as I've mentioned before, is written from the animal's perspective. It seems like the animals believe what Napoleon's telling them, um, that Snowball snuck in and blew up the farm, or the, the farm, the windmill in the middle of the night as a revenge tactic. Um, what do you believe? Go, go take a look. See what you can find. Let me know. And then we'll talk about it next time.